Well, good morning. God is good, isn't he? And all the time? Amen. God is a good God. Last week, we began a new series entitled Go Deeper. That's what these banners are about. And I want to challenge you over the next few months to go deeper in your your faith, go deeper in your walk with God, go deeper in your experience of the life and power and presence of the Holy Spirit, go deeper in your understanding of the Word of God. And uh, so I'm not quite sure how long this is going to go um, until we have gotten so deep that we have to (laughs) come back to the surface. So uh, someone said to me, talking about my pastoring and ministry, and he said, do you go deep? Someone's quite sure. Um, I said, oh yeah, I go, I go deep. I go, I go really deep. And uh, so I don't know if we're going to go really deep, but uh, how many of you know it's important for us to, if we're going to be spiritually mature, if we want to live a life that honors God and reflects the character and nature of God, if we want to become increasingly strong in our faith to to be able to take what life throws at us and in the midst of it have a joyful spirit and patient endurance, then we need to have roots that go deep into God. And uh, Jeremiah said it this way in chapter 17, verse 7 and 8, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots to the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes, its leaves are always green. It has no worries in the year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Do you know any people like that? It's like no matter that when drought season, what they're going through storms, they're steady, they stand firm against the storm, the leaf does not wither, and there's always a fruitfulness that takes place. And spiritually mature people have, the, have fruit by which we're able to feed from and be refreshed by. They have extending branches that cover those who find shelter Uh, in them, and they have roots that hold them secure and steady. So last week, we looked at what spiritual immaturity is. We looked at the other opposite, spiritual immaturity, and why maturity uh, is important. It's important if you want to appropriate the spiritual inheritance that God has for us, The heir, as long as he's a child, is no better off than the slave, even though he's owner of everything. So he has to grow up before he can receive his inheritance. And we saw that if you want to carry out the purpose for which God designed you, then you need to grow in your maturity in God. Let me mention real quickly, I mentioned mentioned one of the misconceptions about spiritual maturity is that it, we think it comes by chronological age alone. If someone's been a Christian for 50 years, they must be spiritually mature, but that's not necessarily the case. Spiritual maturity doesn't come simply by living um, or by chronological age. It comes by right responses to God and specifically steps of obedience. Um, that puts us on the fast track to spiritual growth. When God challenges us to take a step of faith and obedience, and we take that step, then we grow in our uh, spiritual maturity. A second thing that we, we tend to associate with spiritual maturity is um, is biblical knowledge. We, if we have a lot of biblical knowledge, we must be spiritual. 
But Jesus said to the scribes, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But these are they which spoke of me, but you would not come to me that you might have life. It doesn't, spiritual maturity doesn't come by biblical knowledge alone. It comes by spiritual revelation. When the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and lightens the eyes of our heart to receive his truth. And that truth is like a, a, a glowing neon light. And, and it, um, it changes our life and perspective. And the third thing that we tend to associate with spiritual maturity um, or think is the basis of it is religious activity. And religious activity is good, but that in itself doesn't cause a person to become spiritually mature. Um, the question is what we are doing that's in accordance with the activity of God. So we pray, God, bless what I'm doing. God says, why don't you get in on what I'm doing? And then then I'll bless it for sure. So we're going to talk more about some of those things. But today I want to begin looking at an aspect of who we are in Christ. We need to know certain things about what Christ has accomplished for us in his death and resurrection who we are in Christ, and what provision God has made for us. If we, if we don't understand what Christ has accomplished for us in his death and resurrection, then we will try to do what he has already done. If we don't understand who we are in Christ, then we will try to be who we, we already are. And uh, so next week we're going to look at that more fully, um, who we are in Christ, our identity, in him, but I want to look at a specific aspect of that today. The title of the message is You Belong to Him. You belong to God. You belong to God. Turn to somebody and say, You belong to God. Okay. You belong to God. You belong to God. You belong to God. <laughs> See, just, well, just a whole sweeping statement. You, you belong to God. You belong to God because he created you. you. You belong to God because before the foundation of the world, he called you and chose you. Uh, you belong to God because he ransomed you. He rescued you from your sin and, and took you out of the kingdom of darkness and translated you into the kingdom of his dear son. You are not your own. You are bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You belong to God. Your heart belongs to God. Your mind belongs to God. Your body belongs to God. Your strength belongs to God. Your time, your possessions, it all belongs to God. Now, if we, if we believe that, do you think that would affect how we live? So I, I belong to God. And so I, I live a certain type of life that corresponds to who I am in God. Paul said, live a life that is worthy of the calling you have in Christ Jesus. And the word uh, worthy is a word that actually is taken from a balance. And so he's saying your life ought to be balanced with, correspond to who you are in Christ. You ought to, your lifestyle, your living, your behaviors, your actions should correspond to who you are in him. If you really believe that, do you think it would, we would rearrange some of our priorities or change how we think about ourselves or about others? So I want to talk about this phrase, what it means to, to belong to God. And actually, I'm going to talk about the, the, the theologians call it sanctification. The Bible simply calls it holiness and, uh, and what that means. Sanctification is one of those big words that uh, takes about 20 pages of material to explain. We're not going to 
get into all the details about what that could be. Um, but it's important we understand holiness. We sang about it. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. And we, I don't know about you, um, when I hear holiness, uh, originally I know what it means now and I know what's involved in it and so on. We'll touch on that. But the word holiness for me was uh, caused me to think immediately of rules and prohibitions and regulations that weigh, feel like heavy weights that were put on me. And then I thought, um, or standards that are so high that there's only a few super pious saints who could attain to reaching that standard. Um, or I would think more in terms of what Jesus called the righteousness of the Pharisees uh, rather than the what the Bible calls the beauty of holiness. And uh, you need to understand holy living, rightly understood and rightly per pursued, is a thing of beauty and life and freedom and joy. It produces joyful, vibrant, loving Christians who attract people to Christ. It produces what the Bible calls the beauty of holiness. To taste the flavor of a genuine holy life is to taste and see that the Lord is good. J.I. Packer, author and theologian, wrote, holiness, and this is the best definition I've, I think I've heard of holiness. Holiness is the flavor of a life set apart to God. The flavor of a life set apart to God that has been inwardly renewed by the Spirit to reflect the character of Christ. Holiness is the flavor of a person's life who has been who is set apart and being renewed by the Spirit to reflect the character of Christ. It's not a list of rules or prohibitions. It's not a standard that is so high that we can't reach it. It's not to be confused with the righteousness of the Pharisees. Because holy living, wrongly understood and wrongly pursued, is not a thing of beauty and freedom and life and joy. But it produces people who are arrogant, self-righteous, judgmental, unloving, hypocritical. Instead of producing the, the beauty of holiness, it produces the righteousness of the Pharisees. The righteousness of Pharisees, I'll mention this quickly and then I want to get into um, the beauty of holiness. The righteousness of the, the righteousness of the Pharisees results from focusing on e external uh, behaviors alone rather than genuine heart change and transformation. And so we just change a few behaviors on the outward. And, and there's no inward heart change. Um, Jesus said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Leaven causes things, something to grow, so it gives the appearance of being much more than it really is. But it's basically all air, it's empty. And uh, the leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. It's wearing a mask. And it's given an impression on the external that we are much more than we really are internally. So there's a very little heart change um, because we focus on external behaviors alone. Now, external behaviors need to be brought in line with the Word of God, but it doesn't come by just changing, by making a few outward behaviors. It comes from genuine heart change. Secondly, the righteousness of the Pharisees um, emphasize the letter of the, the law rather than the spirit of the law the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. The Bible says the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Legalism misses the heart of God and the real purpose of the law. What is the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law is to produce 
two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And so he's, he's saying those are commands. That's the law. The law ultimately is all about love. And uh, love has preceded that. Jesus one time said that the, the, all the prophets and the, the law hang on these two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and, and strength and love your neighbor as you, yourself. If you hang a coat on a hook, the hook has to be there before the coat. And the hook which the, the law and the prophets hang on is love, love for God and love for others. Before the law came along, love was what God was all about. It's what he had in his heart all along. It's what the law hangs on. It hangs on love. Without love, then we lose the real intent of the law. And so if we focus on the letter of the law, we miss the heart of God. And it produces um, legalism and judgmentalism. The third thing, focus of, of the righteousness of Pharisees, is that it focuses on the sinfulness of sin rather than the goodness of God. Now, it doesn't, doesn't deny the sinfulness of sin, but Jesus was able to be a, a friend to sinners and embrace sinners because he didn't view them as someone who was contagious with sin and uh, that he, his focus was on the sin so he couldn't embrace the sinner. He was able to find in the greatest sinner the goodness of God to be released on their behalf. So we're going to talk about the beauty of holiness. When I talk about holiness, I'm talking about what you would have seen in Christ, the, the, the flavor of a life set apart, being inwardly renewed by the Spirit to reflect the character and nature of Christ. Let me just say this about holiness. God is holy. And therefore, the Bible says, God says, you shall be holy, for I am holy. But when the Bible talks about the holiness of God, we're talking about a whole different um, idea. The basic, basic meaning of holy is to set apart, to be separate from, to be set apart, as we're going to see in a moment. And God is set apart from his creation by virtue of his divine attributes and his moral excellencies. However, God's holiness is more than just a separateness. God's holiness emphasizes the aspects of his transcendence. God is so holy, he is, so, he is infinitely transcendent above and beyond uh, his creation. Um, his awesome greatness is absolute and supreme. And what we call the fear of God is a human response to the infinite transcendence of God's awesome greatness and power and the unapproachable holiness of his being. God is holy. He is infinitely above and beyond and separate from his creation. Yet this God comes to us and says, you shall be holy and you shall He's not so far removed from us that he cannot descend to us to accomplish what he wants to do in our life. So let me, let me point this out. The basic meaning of holiness is to be separate or set apart. Something that is holy has been set apart from what is common and consecrated to the Lord and to his service. So it might be a building might be an ark, might be a person, um, or an object. But when that is taken and set apart from all the, the rest, it is set up, apart to God for his purpose. So there's a threefold aspect of uh, being set apart. Number one, you're set apart from the world 
and all of its corruption and its sin. So we were sanctified, the Bible says. He took us, set us apart from the world and its corruption by sin. It is set apart to God as precious in his sight and belonging uniquely to him. So it is set apart from the world, set apart to God, and set apart for God for the purpose and service of God. It's con- we would use the word consecrated. So it's separated, it's dedicated to God, it's consecrated to his service. We see this in uh, Romans chapter 12, the first two verses. He says, in view of the mercies of God, present yourself a living and holy sacrifice. Holy, they are means set apart to God as a, as a sacrifice. Set yourself apart to God. Acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that is being set apart from the world. Not being conformed to the world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, his purpose and will in your life, which is to be set aside, set apart for the purpose of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now let me uh, sort of illustrate this point. I mentioned that in each of our sessions we would have something called Pastor Ed's treasure chest. This is Pastor Ed's treasure chest and uh, we're going to look into that chest. The Bible says a wise scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a household who brings forth from his treasure things new and things old, things fresh and things familiar. So we're going to check to see what we have. All right. We've got one thing here. This is an engagement ring, a really, really big engagement ring. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I need a couple who are engaged, sort of in this area somewhere <laughs> around here. <laughs> do I have any volunteers? Um, <laughs> we have a couple right here that would fit the bill. All right, won't you come up here? So everybody can see you. <laughs> the prize is you, each other. <laughs> All right, here, you hold that. All right, let me ask you a few questions. Um, when Ernie proposed to you, was it romantic? Or was it, was it more like something on... World's Funniest Home video, Videos. <laughs> it was romantic. Okay. And you, you gave her a ring? How did you, how did you do that? Just... <laughs> you want to know how it happened? Yeah, how you plan, how'd you plan uh, that moment? I got down on, on one knee, and I went to go take the ring out of my pocket, but my hand was shaking so much I couldn't find it. <laughs> so then, so then I tried to put the ring on her finger, and I couldn't. So she grabbed it and put it on her own finger. Okay, that's good. She said, I'm going to get engaged tonight one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's why that would have been much easier to find oh, in your yeah. pocket <laughs> and put on her finger. That would be a little hard. But I would have found it. <laughs> I would have, yeah, I would have seen it in his pocket. Yeah, right. What's that? All right, let me share with you. When the Bible says we belong to God, it's a lot, it's, a, it's very much like an engagement. When, when Ernie 
proposed marriage to you. He sanctified you. He took you out of all the women in the world that he could have chosen. He chose you. You were special to him. You, he called you, chose you to be, belong to him alone. He set his affections upon you and called you to be his wife, to uniquely belong to him in a way that no other woman will. And when you said yes, you were sanctifying him. You separated him out from all the other men in your life. And you said, I want you to belong to me in a way that no one else, no other woman does. And you were saying to each other, you're precious in my sight. We belong to one another in a way that is uniquely special to us. And together, you two agree to live together in marriage and, and share life as the joint heirs and grace of life. Now, when you said yes, did things change in your life? Yes. And what, how did, what were some of the changes that came, that immediately resulted from Okay. <laughs> once, once you're engaged, your focus becomes on the wedding mm -hmm. date. And so for next number of months, your whole focus is on the wedding. And uh, everything else in life becomes sort of mundane it ultimately points to the wedding date when you're united forever. And your behavior toward other guys would change. Your, um, your attitude, your devotion would be to him. And that's how it is when, we, when God takes us for himself. We belong to him. We focus on the day when we will be forever united with him. And there is a security in knowing that we are um, bound together, that our futures, your futures are bound together. And uh, you begin to live a life that corresponds to a couple who is engaged to be married. So how did you, how did you do that again? Give her your... Something like this. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, you can hold on to that. Hi, right, thank you very, very much. <laughs> now, when we, we talk about holiness, we usually start with the behaviors, and, and um, holy living is the behaviors of, of a holy person. But God starts by calling us to himself, and we belong to him. And it's, it's out of the fact that God has called me to himself. I have been set apart from the world. I have been set apart as unique and special and belonging to God. And out of that, we are set apart for the purpose of God. And there's a new desire in your heart to want to live for the purpose of God because you belong to him. I want to read a passage from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 to 21. The Apostle Paul says to Timothy, in a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver, some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions and the cheap ones for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, then you will be a utensil that God can use for his purpose. I don't know about you, I want more than anything to be used by God, to be used for his purpose, to be set apart, to not only be set apart as belonging to him, but set apart as being used by him. And he says, if you keep yourself pure and 
live a holy life, not because it's a set of rules and regulations you have to follow, but because you belong to him, then you will be use, useful for his purpose. Your life will be clean, literally made holy or sanctified, set apart for the work and purpose of God, and you'll be ready for the master to use every good, for every good work. A man got up in a revival meeting one time and gave his testimony, kind of an unusual testimony. He said, brothers and sisters, I, I know, you know and I know that I ain't been what I ought to have been my whole life. He said, you know, I, I stole, I told lies, I got drunk, I gambled, got into fights and ran around with women I cursed and swore, but I thank the Lord God that there ain't one thing I, I ain't never done. I ain't never lost my religion. Now, does that sound like a, a vessel that's going to be mightily used by God? I don't think so. The realizing God has called you out and separate belonging to himself. Then he wants to use us for his purpose. Then we begin to apply his word and his will and in obedience to God begin to make ourselves ready for the purpose of God. Second Peter chapter 1 says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith, goodness, to goodness, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have these qualities, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten why he has been cleansed from his past sins. Why were we cleansed from our past sins? Because we have been set apart from the world, set apart to God as special in his eyes as uniquely belonging to him and set apart to the purpose and service of God. Otherwise, we've forgotten why God cleansed us. It was ultimately so that we would be set apart for his purpose. And I want to wrap it up with Romans chapter 12. He says, <clears throat> in view in the, in the light of God's mercies, which are all the things that God had outlined in the first 11 chapters, he says, in view of that, I plead with you, give your bodies to God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. When you think of all he's done for you, he saved you by the grace of God. Your sins were forgiven. He made you a new creation and dwelt by the life of God, empowered by the Spirit of God. You've been adopted into the family of God. You have encountered the miracle of God's amazing grace and the wonder of God's amazing love, the incredible price that Christ paid to redeem you from the penalty of sin and, and the power of Satan. And so the only reasonable response to that amazing demonstration of love and grace is to present yourself to God as a living sacrifice. To consecrate yourself totally to God, to his service, to his will, to his purpose. Not out of duty and obligation, not out of guilt and shame, but out of love and gratitude. And I think of a verse in Psalm 116, verse 12 says, what shall we render to God for all of his benefits to us? 
What can we give God in return for all he's done for us and given to us? Well, the only thing we can give him, the only thing that he really wants is us. That's really the only gift we can give him. Everything else he has given to us, we can simply give back to himself. God says, the only thing I want is you. A full a heart commitment, a full devotion to me. And the person who will, with single-minded focus and wholehearted devotion, there's nothing God can't do through that person. So, who are we in Christ? God has taken us out of the world, dedicated us to himself, and consecrates us to the work and purpose he has in the earth. There's no greater thing I can think of than that. So, what is holiness? Holiness is one of the most beautiful words in the, in the Bible when you understand the beauty of holiness. Jesus demonstrated the beauty of holiness, not the righteousness of the Pharisees. Does that mean that we have less of a standard? That means we have a, a higher standard. We want to live a life in accordance with and worthy of the calling of God on our life. We want to be a utensil that God can use in great and powerful ways. Let's pray together. Well, Father, <clears throat> it, <clears throat> it is incredible to us that the God who three times is called holy, 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 holy is the Lord. He is so infinitely transcendent above and beyond us, why should such a holy God come down to us? Because he binds himself to us in covenant, in love, in commitment, and in joy. We belong to him. Remind us of this truth. When we start to be tempted in different areas, let us grab hold of that. I belong to the one who is holy, holy, holy. We give our lives to you. We commit ourselves fully to you. And we pray that you would use us in great ways. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.